Excellent. Well, I'm actually recording this uh, session, so this is all going to be available on YouTube, uh, so you can watch it again and again and again to your heart's content. Um, DNA is not the easiest thing to understand. Sometimes you need to, to go in several times before a little bit of it sticks. But um, uh, as John said, I, I took over, uh, or I joined as, as co-administrator on the project um, earlier this year. Um, I've been running my own Gleason DNA project for the last couple of years. I also run the Farrell DNA project, the O'Malley DNA project, the um, Maloney DNA project, the Boylan DNA project. So I am addicted to DNA. And I think what you're going to see now is a summary of where we are with the Malloy DNA project and some of the wonderful uh, revelations that it has uh, produced. So if, if you have any questions at all, please raise your hand and, and uh, do ask during the presentation. We'll also have a little Q&A session afterwards so that uh, we can then talk about some specific uh, questions. And how many people in the audience have actually done the DNA test? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So, all the, the, so there's quite a few people, ten, 10 people in the audience. You will see some of your results up here. Um, they're all privatized, um, but you will recognize your most distant ancestor, and that's the way of, of identifying yourself on, on some of the slides. So um, to start off with, we're going to look at the Malloy's in historical texts, uh, DNA testing for beginners, the Malloy DNA project and the DNA results. Do they match the historical texts or do they differ? Do they tell us something else? And where do we go next? So those are the kind of topics that we're going to talk uh, through. Um, I could talk for Ireland, so uh, John will indicate to me when 50 minutes is coming close uh, so that I know when to stop. But um, DNA actually connects us with a variety of different things. It can be associated with specific locations and specific geographies. Uh, it can be associated with specific surnames as well. So some surnames, as John said for the Malloys, are associated with specific DNA markers. Um, also, using DNA, we've built the tree of mankind. And of course, the Malloys, before they were Malloys, were a tribe somewhere around the Midlands of Ireland. And before that, they had to cross over on the land bridge uh, through what is today England. But back then, it didn't have any name and was connected to the continent. And then before that, there was the Ice Age. So they were all down in Malaga, having a little holiday down there in the little refuges in southern Spain. And then before that, they were back in Eastern Europe around the Caspian Sea, and then back into Africa 50,000 years ago, and back to the origins of man 250,000 years ago. So the Malloys have got quite a history. Um, and from using DNA, we're able to actually construct the, the tree of mankind. And the Malloys sit on a particular downstream branch of that tree of mankind, and we'll be taking a look at that. Also, DNA can be associated with the historical texts, because I think a lot of you will know that the Malloys, uh, probably, uh, certainly the Malloys of Offaly, are uh, supposedly descended from Nile of the Nine Hostages. Uh, not only that, but there are a lot of other surnames descended from Nile of the Nine Hostages. Now, if that is true, it means that the Malloys are genetically related to those people that carry those other surnames. So we're going to take a look at that as well. And uh, of course, DNA can be a very, very useful way for helping you break through those brick walls in your family tree. And I think a lot of people uh, are probably have a brick wall around about the 1800 mark. How many people have able, been able to go past 1800 into the 1700s on their family tree? Has anybody been able to do that? One person? One person? Yeah, OK. Two people? Right, OK. So it's quite rare because um, uh, the Irish records tend to run out at around about the 1800 mark. So I've only been able to identify half of my great-great-great-grandparents. And um, my brick walls and my various ancestral lines are around about the 1800-1830 mark. But DNA can actually help us break through some of those brick walls. But let's look at the Malloys in historical texts. Where did they come from? And there are a variety of different sources for um, Malloys in historical texts. There's the general sources, which you always have to take with a pinch of salt. Wikipedia, for example. It's not the font of all knowledge, but some people think it is, and they just copy it and say, oh, that's definitely true. Not the case. But it does give you a pointer to go to look for additional sources 
primary sources which can actually give you a lot of insights. There's a variety of surname dictionaries. Um, we'll be looking at Wolf and we'll be looking at O'Hart and Grenham as well. There's some surname distribution maps and we'll be looking at those as well. Uh, various learned texts, and I know there's quite a few Malloy scholars over the years. There's probably one or two of them in the audience today. We'll be looking at some of those uh, sources. Um, academic journals. Now, I haven't done uh, any in-depth research on that, but there probably are <coughs> Malloy-related articles in some scientific journals, like the Munster Historical and Archaeological Journal, that type of thing. And then we have the ancient annals. And thankfully, a lot of these annals are available online now. So you can actually look at the annals of the Four Masters online. Um, Roger O'Farrell's Linea Antiqua is also available online. Um, the uh, UCC Cork have done a wonderful uh, project called Celts and a lot of the old ancient annals, and there's about 40, 50, 60 of them uh, specific for Ireland, they're available online as well. Uh, Bart Yasky did a PhD thesis a couple of years ago and he has produced 76 pages of genealogical tables related to the royal Irish dynasties. Unfortunately, the Malloys are not in that, but it is a very, very useful uh, source of information. And then, most recently, and very importantly, we have Leower, Morn, and Anelach, the great book of Irish genealogies, written by McFirbishig in the late 1600s, and published, well, translated, edited, and published in 2004 by Nolago Morila, a professor in um, University College Galway. And that could be a very rich source for uh, Malloy genealogies. Some of the local uh, Malloy scholars, Liam Cox, the Malloys of Firkal, and this is from Riat Namija, uh, 1973. We also have a report that was commissioned by Ted O'Keefe from the Irish Midlands ancestry. So if anybody is looking, f doing some active research, do get in touch with the Irish Midlands ancestry group uh, because they will help you look through some of the old records. Uh, and you see from the table of contents, goes back to about 1824, 1820. Um, so again, it's bringing us back to those brick walls in the 1800, 1830 time period. Uh, the Eglish, or Eglish um, Historical Society have produced this wonderful book on uh, the history of the parish of Fircal. Now, um, any, of the, any of the historical society here? Yes, we have some members here as well. So if there's any questions, then we'll direct them to you. Um, but again, a wonderful piece of uh, work done by a local history group. And then as John was saying, some individuals don't have their brick wall in the 1800s, don't have their brick wall in the 1700s. This particular uh, uh, piece of, of work <coughs> goes back to, and it's not very easy to read on this screen, but it goes back to 1629, I believe. So. With this particular person, supposing you're a very close DNA match to one of the descendants in this family tree, it means that you can piggyback onto their work and you can go back to 1629 as well. And that's one of the great things about DNA is it actually can connect you with people who've done a lot more research or who have access to records that you don't. And immediately you can piggyback and jump back in time, maybe 100 years, maybe 200 years. So those are all the various sources that are some of the, the, the local scholarship that has been done on the Malloy uh, genealogy. But looking at the Reverend Patrick Wolfe's surname dictionary, this is his entry for um, uh, uh, Malloy, and in Irish, and please forgive my pronunciation, Omwelvue, is that yeah. fairly? Okay, I, I'm, I'm from Dublin, so you know my, my Gaelic is not going to be as good as a lot of people here, so, so apologies for that. Well, you can see that um, it's a descendant of Muel, Muel Mua, noble chief. Um, they formed a distinguished family from the southern Wee Neil. And of course, the Wee Neil were, the E Neil were descendant of Nile of the Nine Hostages. Um, in Meath, the same descent as the McGagans, I believe that's pronounced, McGogans maybe as well. Um, also called the Kimmel Fiachach, uh, Nile of the Nine Hostages. Uh, we also have a, uh, they moved to Offaly. And then we have uh, here, number two, McFirbish, and that's now or more than the Nailoch, uh, mentions another family of the name, a branch uh, in County Roscommon. And then we also have the Malloys of Oak Park near Boyle. And there's a Sligo variant as well. So we're getting Offaly, sorry, Offaly, Roscommon, and Sligo from this particular entry in the surname dictionary. 
But this isn't the only entry. We also have Muel Mui, which is from uh, Sligo. We have uh, Omuel Vedog from, um, where is that from? Donegal. Donegal. Yeah, Donegal. Um, we have another one then from uh, County Mayo. Donegal, also in use in County Mayo. We have another one, uh, which is from, where one is this from? Ulster and Connacht. So uh, again, there's a very big mixture of Malloys around. And this one here, um, it's in Connacht, where it's not uncommon, sometimes anglicized to Mully, rather than, and generally Molloy with a U. Uh, here's another one here. Uh, this one is, I believe, Donegal. Then we have another one um, here, down, uh, which again is Slowy, but also Molloy. So the, 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 the transition from the Gaelic name to the anglicized version can produce a lot of Molloys of various different origins. And the key point really to take from this is there may be a lot of Molloys all around the country who spring from different origins. And it's not just uh, all Molloys are related to each other. Some of them might be related to Nile of the Nine Hostages. Some of them might be related to Brian Baru. So genetically, what I'm expecting from this is that we're going to see lots of different genetic groups of Molloys arising all over the country. And this is a summary. We have the big group in Offaly, the Southern Weenil. There's also a, a group in uh, Roscommon, Oak Park, Boyle, Sligo, where it's quite rare, Donegal, Mayo, Connacht, and Ulster. So it's really covering the entire country in many ways. And this is reflected in the surname distribution maps. So if we, we look at a few of those as well, this is from John Grenham's web, website. Again, you see Down, Offaly, Roscommon, Mayo. <coughs> Excuse me, he talks about the origins of the name Omuel Eve, servant of Hugh. Now, um, in ancient Ireland, there were probably a lot of Hughes, and probably quite a few of them had servants. So you can see that if that was the derivation of the name, you'd probably get Malloys springing up in various parts of the country wherever there was a Hugh with servants. So again, this suggests it could very well be a multi-origin name because of this uh, derivation. Uh, and again, pointing to the, the fact that there's probably a lot of different origins for the Malloys within Ireland. To add further uh, um, uh, 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 excitement to the mix, there are possible Scottish origins of the Malloys and the MacLuys in um, Argyll, the Argyll region of Scotland, um, were septs of the clan Stuart of Butte. They include MacLoy, Loy, Lewis, Malloy, and Milloy family descended from, the, from Lewis Fullerton or Fowlerton. There's also MacLeod and MacLeod. They can sometimes be Malloy. And even um, MacGillarua and MacGillroy, um, uh, this, this could be some of the source of some of the Scottish Malloys. So now we might see that some people called uh, Malloy, or one of the variants, could actually be Scottish in origin as well. And this should be reflected in the DNA too. Turning to Ireland, this is a surname distribution map of where the Malloys were in 1911. And I think what stands out is that they were everywhere, you know, <laughs> apart from the southwest part of the country. But the Malloys were really quite a ubiquitous group. They got into every single corner of Ireland. If we go back to 1901, again, you see that they're still all over the place. Molloy, M-O-L-L-O-Y, is the most common variant with 542 um, instances. Malloy was 59, Molloy was 74, um, but Molloy with the O is the most common variant. If we just look at Molloy with the U, they're all around Connacht. So it's interesting how the surname distribution maps can localize a particular variant spelling to a particular area. What we don't know, of course, is do these people all share the same DNA, or is it a variety of different DNA profiles we're going to find? If we go back to 1850 and Griffith's valuation, now we're beginning to see a little bit more focused concentration of Malloys, and you notice the big blob in the Midlands, so that's where we are now. This would be the Offaly Malloys, more than likely, but you can see that um, even in 1850, the Malloys were heading to the big conurbations, the big cities. We have Galway here, we have Dublin over here, Waterford down here, Belfast to an extent up there, but there's a lot of rural Malloys in Donegal, because there's no major town up here, but a lot of rural Malloys there, uh, also in uh, Mayo as well, 
um, but we are seeing this big focus in Offaly. Again, a different map uh, looking at the 1850s uh, in Griffiths, and again, Malloy is all over the place. Uh, this was Malloy, only, only three instances of Malloy, doesn't tell us much. Um, this was the, uh, the four Malloys, again, South Leitrim for a strange reason, and also in Offaly. And these were the Mulloys, and again, we're seeing that same concentration around Connacht, but also <coughs> some in uh, Tipperary, middle, southern Tipperary, and also a few in the Midlands as well. Um, and this was Molloy, again, all over the country, the most frequent spelling. But if we jump back now 200 years ago to 1659, and this is from Pender's census, and this only looks at titled people. So this would be people who were gentry, gentlemen, that type of thing. There were only 61 Molloys in Ireland at that time, but there was a big concentration around uh, the Midlands. And if we look at that uh, in terms of the most common variants, Molloy being 17 was the Midlands, Molloy with one L being the Midlands as well. The Molloy with the U is for some reason South Leitrim, and then the O Molloy with the U is the Inishon Peninsula. So again, who were these people? Were they separate? Were they from the same stock? Were they different? It doesn't, we, it, this raises some interesting questions. The question is, do we see this reflected in the DNA results? So let's turn to the DNA. What is it? How does it help? And I'm going to give you a brief run through on the ABCs of DNA. And it's all very simple, taking a DNA test, you swab your cheek or you give a sample of saliva. That goes into a little uh, test tube. We did one just before uh, the start of, of the talk. And so I have got 30 DNA kits here. So if anybody does want to do DNA testing, um, I do have kits available. Um, once uh, your sample has been sent off in the post, it goes to the lab. They say, oh, blue blood, it must be a uh, royalty. And uh, they put it through their machines, and it comes out with your own results. And it's pu published on your own web page, protected by your own username protected by your password. If you want privacy, you can give a false name. You don't have to give your real name. There's no reason why you, there's no obligation to. So, you know, when I, when people are sensitive about privacy, I say, well, just use a false name. And you still get the same results. You know who you are. Um, not only that, but they compare your results with everybody in their database. And currently they have over 629,000 Y-DNA profiles. That's the father, father, father line in their database, and they publish your list of matches on your web page, and then you can contact them by email. Hey, we're a DNA match. Maybe we're related. Do you want to swap family trees and see how we're connected? And that's how we actually break through some of our brick walls. And also, this particular uh, company, Family Tree DNA, um, have created the infrastructure for doing projects like the Malloy DNA project. Now, taking a, a closer look at the DNA that's in that test tube, so you've swabbed your cheek, you've dislodged some cheek cells into that test tube. This is what a, a cheek cell looks like. And there's various parts of the cell that will be useful for family history purposes. First part is these ones here. These are the mitochondria, <coughs> the little blue things here. They're like the batteries within the cell. They give it the cell the energy. And that you only get them from your mother, and she got them from her mother, and she got them from her mother. Mother, 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 mother. So it's very useful for going back along your mother, mother, mother line. Um, in the nucleus of the cell, you've got 46 chromosomes arranged in 23 pairs. You've got two copies of chromosome 1, two copies of chromosome 2, one copy you get from your father, the other copy you get from your mother. You get 50% of your DNA from your mother, 50% from your father. And that's how it's arranged in these pairs. And the 23rd pair, they're also known as the sex chromosomes because they determine whether you're a woman or a man. If you get two X chromosomes, you're a woman. If you get an X and a Y chromosome, you're a man. And um, it's the Y chromosome in particular that we're interested in, because only men have the Y chromosome. And the men get their Y chromosome from their father. And he gets it from his father, his father, 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 going back along in time along the same line as the surname. So Malloy, 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 Malloy will follow the same path as the Y DNA signature for that particular Malloy group. 
so that gives us three main types of tests. The Y-DNA, like I said, going back along the direct male line, father, 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 all the way back in time more than 200,000 years ago. Uh, this is why it's very, very good for tracing the migration of humans out of Africa and wh how we've been able to, to build this wonderful tree of mankind using the Y-DNA as a marker of movement of people around the globe. On the other side of the tree, you have the uh, direct female line, mother, 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 mother. Uh, and that, again, is very useful for tracing human migration using, of course, a female <coughs> marker to go back in time more than 200,000 years. In the middle, you've got all the other chromosomes. When it's, they call it autosomal DNA. This is all of your chromosomes, all 46 of your chromosomes. If you're a woman, all 45 out of the 46 if you're a man, because they throw in the uh, sex chromosomes as well as part of the analysis. This is useful for researching all of your ancestral lines. So if your Malloy is in the middle of your family tree, do an autosomal DNA test. If it's on your father, father, father line, do the Y DNA test. Um, I never really use the, the mother, mother, mother line because it's not a very useful test. You're going to get more bang for your buck out of doing the autosomal DNA test, or if you're a man, doing the Y DNA test. The only limitation of the autosomal test, it only goes back about five, six, seven generations. So it only goes back to about the level of your great, 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 great grandparents. It takes you into about the 1750s, the 1700s, that type of thing. So, um, but it, it does look at all your ancestral lines. So for general genealogy, it's the most useful. For Malloy-specific genealogy, if you're looking at the Malloy surname, the Y DNA going back along your father, father, father line. So that's deep and recent ancestry with the Y DNA. Now, let's have a look at the Malloy DNA project and let's look at the results and see what we've actually achieved. And it's been running since 2007. John's already showed you this. We actually do have 105 <coughs> members. If you want to find this, all you have to do is Google FTDNA or Family Tree DNA and Malloy, and it'll bring up this project. And that's the actual uh, web address there, familytreedna.com slash groups slash Malloy. But just <coughs> Google it, and you'll actually find the Malloy DNA project. And you've seen this recruitment. It's been a steady recruitment since 2007, going all the way up to the present. Uh, more people joining all the time. And to join the Malloy Project, you find the Malloy DNA Project. Click on Join in the photo, or do the DNA test. It'll be the Y DNA 37 test for men. For women, you can do the autosomal DNA test. Um, and I do have DNA kits here available today if anybody wants to do the test. Um, and Looking at the direct male line, here's a map of the Y chromosome. You've got a short arm up here, you've got a long arm down here, and dotted along the, the chromosome are all these genes, which are typical male genes, like ability to remember and tell jokes. Very, very common uh, characteristic of men. Uh, refusal to ask for directions. Uh, you know, I, I think that everyone can agree that's a male characteristic. You know. um, uh, one of my favorites is uh, the, uh, oh yeah, the DC-10, the ability to identify aircraft. This, of course, was essential for survival uh, back in ancient Ireland. So um, this is what a, a gene looks like, or what a chromosome looks like. And as well as these genes, you'll have DNA markers dotted all along the length of the chromosome. And it's those DNA markers that we're particularly interested in for the Molloy project. Now, if you unravel the, the chromosome, you get these letters. And you might have seen genetic code written just as a series of letters. Well, these letters are uh, bases, G, C, A, T. G always binds with C. A always binds with T. And we've got a daddy long legs in to keep us company. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, and uh, one strand of the DNA is a mirror image of the other. But the most important thing, uh, because I don't, you don't need to understand anything about all of this except that there are two types of Y DNA <coughs> marker, and we use both types of Y DNA marker in the Malloy DNA project. One of them is called the short tandem repeat, and you can see here that these bases are TAC, TAC, TAC. So this sequence of letters is repeated three times, and the value for that marker is therefore three. So when you get your results and you see it's a list of numbers, that's all it is. It it's, tells you how many times a particular set of letters are repeated. 
So this would be a value of 3. The other type of DNA marker is called a SNP. And that's just a substitution. One letter, it was maybe a G in the father, but there was a mistake when it was passed on to the son, and it became an A. And now the son has an A, and he passes it on to his children, and they pass it on to their children. And that little mutation then uh, identifies a new branch of that particular family. The rest of the brothers that he had might have got the G, and they'll be exactly the same as the father. But one of the sons will have developed this mutation, and that mutation now characterizes all of his descendants. Very, very useful in terms of marking which branch of the family you come from. Three types of STR tests, the Y37, 67, and 111. So you can, there's up to 111 markers is how many you can test. Uh, we recommend people starting at 37. Um, it's on sale at the moment at 139, but um, Family Tree DNA have given me an extra discount for the Malloy gathering, uh, so it's down to 129. So if anybody wants to buy the DNA test, it's $129, which works out at 110 euro. Um, in terms of the SNP markers, you can buy a single SNP test, which is $39. The SNP packs, uh, and here's a, there's a variety of different SNP packs for different branches of the tree of mankind. And the ultimate one is the big Y test. Uh, it's quite expensive. It's usually $575. It's $395 in the sale. And that will bring you down to the finest downstream branches of the tree of mankind. So that's, uh, and quite a few people in the, in the project have actually done that, and we'll have a look at that. So these are your results. This is what it looks like if you just look at your own results. And it's just, like I said, it's a series of numbers. This marker has a value of 11. This marker has a value of 12. This doesn't tell you very much in and of itself. It places you roughly on the tree of mankind. So this particular one is, belongs to the group R. Now the group R is a Western European group. If it was group O, you'd be from China. If it was group Q, you'd be maybe uh, South American Indian. Um, so this just gives you a very, very crude idea of where in the world your Y DNA comes from. You know, if you're Irish, you're not going to be surprised by the fact that your DNA roughly comes from Western Europe, because that's where we all started off 25,000 years ago. So, um, and also, the SDR signature is a string of numbers. The SNP signature is more a, a single SNP. This is, the, this is the DNA marker that marks the end of this particular branch of the tree of mankind. And this is an example of human migration out of Africa. Uh, so in Africa, we've got haplogroups A and B. In uh, Australia, they've got C and T. China has O. South America has Q. And Western Europe has R. So that's where the Malloys sit, on that particular group. But this is 25,000 years ago. You know, it's not useful from a genealogical point of view. We need to come more downstream. Um, the population geneticists are mapping this out from the top down. We start with our family trees, and we go from the bottom up. But what's happening now is that we're actually beginning to meet in the middle. And uh, we're, we've reached the stage where we are so advanced now with these SNP markers that we are actually coming so far downstream on the tree of mankind, we're beginning to link up with individual surnames and individual family names. And the Malloys are one of them. So, and that's the tree of mankind. Um, just to give you an example of how many branches there were over the, a period of time and how many more there have been in recent years. This is cutting edge technology. People who are, do, if you're doing a DNA test today, you are actually being on the crest of the wave of scientific discovery. You know, this is uh, hot off the press. Now, the Malloy DNA project, this is what your results would look like when they come in. And here you can see somebody, and again, I've privatized it up there. That's the name. That's the, the last four numbers of the kit number. But this is what it might look like. This person has tested to 67 markers. And they have one match at that level. It's another Malloy. The genetic distance from that Malloy is six. What that means is that person is six steps away from an exact match. If it was an exact match, the genetic distance would be zero. But this person is six steps away. It means that six mutations have occurred somewhere along the line of descent 
from the common ancestor of these two people to the two people living today. So they're not closely related. They might have a common ancestor sometime back in the 1600s or the 1500s. The other thing that is important is that he's tested to 67, so you can compare him to other people who've tested at 67. You can also compare him at the 37 marker level, and at that level he has two matches, um, and they're a genetic distance of three out of 37. So three steps away from an exact match. Um, genetic distance is an important tool that we use in trying to group people together. Uh, the threshold for declaring a match would be four out of 37. So four, three, two, one, zero, you're a match, if you have one of those. If you're five out of 37, you do not appear on each other's match lists. Again, we're com comparing to over 629,000 records, 289,000 YDNA37 records. Um, also, this tip tool is quite useful because it predicts uh, the time to the most recent common ancestor. In other words, how far back are you connected? So based on your DNA, it will give you an estimate of how far back the common ancestor is. You know, if it's within, say, the last 200 years, going back to about 18, 1800, you should theoretically be able to look at your family trees, compare them, and actually find a common ancestor or maybe brothers. Two people who were brothers came from the same townland, came from the same county, um, and that's where you're brick walled, but it may be very well be that you'll be able to find that your most distant known ancestor was a brother of the other person's most distant known ancestor. And this is where you uh, contact your matches, and you can click on the email icon there and send them an email. You share your family tree information. You try to find a common ancestor and break through your own particular brick wall. And that's where a lot of people find this particularly useful, because you never know which one of your matches has the family Bible. That goes back into the 1700s. And maybe they have your ancestor written down there. That happened to me recently. Um, I mean, it took two years for it to happen. But uh, finally, I got a match. I wrote to them, and I found out that they had the research notes of Professor Wardell, professor of history in Trinity College, Dublin, in 1920, who'd done a research study on the Morgan family. And my ancestors were there. And I was able to jump back from 1800 to the 1400s in Wales, in Newport. Um, I'm still trying to cope with the fact that I'm Welsh. Uh, you know, I'm not sure how I feel about that. But uh, it, it's just amazing how DNA can, if it connects you with the right person, it jumps, allows you to jump all the way back in time. But as administrators of the um, Malloy DNA project, what John and myself will do is we'll group people based on their genetic distance to each other and also an analysis of uh, the SNPs. And these are the terminal SNPs over here. And this is the most downstream branch of the tree of mankind that that person has tested to so far. And you can do additional tests that will bring you further downstream, further downstream, further downstream. And the big Y test is the most relevant from that point of view. So that's genetic distance and the terminal SNPs, as they're called. These are the results of the Malloy DNA project. And what we have is we have got six groups in the project. You can see these are the individual members here in their groups. A lot of them have actually done the big Y test. So they have gone right down the tree of mankind as far as you can go. They're currently at cul-de-sac. You know, and it might be 1,000 years ago, it might be 500 years ago, it might be 2,000 years ago. Group one, they're Ireland. Group two, they're from Ireland. Group three, they're from Ireland. Group four, they're probably from Offaly. Um, group five are Scots-Irish. Group six, from Ireland. So we're going to take a closer look at each of these groups and show you some of the characteristics, and then we're going to focus on the Offaly Malloys and uh, let you know just exactly what we've found. Now, you won't be able to see these names, but we have a Macmillan, Purcell, McSparron, Callaghan, Dempsey, and uh, Gamsby. Now, the big question is, why are there different surnames among <coughs> these Malloys? And there's three possibilities. There's either been a switch in the surname or the DNA. Um, these could be relatives that are before the time that surnames were adopted, which is roughly about uh, a thousand years ago. Or it could, these could be just chance matches. 
due to something called convergence, uh, which is a technical term. It just means that people have uh, mutated away from each other, and then over time, the mutations have come back to approximate, so that it looks like they're real matches, but in fact, the common ancestor is thousands of years ago rather than hundreds of years ago. So there are chance matches as well. Um, and also, there's a large ungrouped uh, group of Malloys here, and they don't belong to any of the six groups that have been identified so far, either because they are a very rare branch of the family, and they're the only person from their particular branch of the Malloys to have tested so far. And as more people join the project, I would predict that what we'll see is that a lot of these Malloys will be moved up into the grouped area of the project. They'll find a match, and they'll form a new group, group seven, group eight, group nine. The other possibility is that the, there has been a surname switch or a DNA switch. These people are perhaps Malloy by surname, but somebody else by DNA. So it could be a Murray or a Kelly or something else. Um, there are many different causes for the surname or the DNA switch. Back in ancient Ireland, if you were to uh, uh, pledge allegiance to your clan chief, um, you might change your name to that of the clan chief to, as a mark of your allegiance. So you might start off as um, a Kelly, and then the Malloys, uh, you wanted to show allegiance to them, so you changed your name to Malloy. So you'd be a Malloy by name, but a Kelly by DNA. Another, and this was very common with servants, soldiers, vassals, tenants, slaves, you know, so the Malloy clan, if they had soldiers, they'd all be called Malloy. If they had vessels, uh, vassals or tenants, they'd all be called Malloy as well, potentially. Another reason is, of course, adoption fostering, which was very big in Breton society. Um, so that could be another explanation for why there's been a switch in the surname or the DNA. Supposing you're a young widow. Your first husband dies. You've got three young kids. The oldest is six months old. You marry uh, your second husband uh, six months after the first one has died. What name are, they, are your children going to have? They'll switch their surname to that of the second husband. So that, again, is another reason for why you get this switch in surnames. Sometimes a legal condition of marriage. You won't marry my daughter unless you change your name to Malloy. So that could also be another reason for why this uh, surname switch occurred. Uh, taking the wife's name upon marriage, if they were of higher social status. Oliver Cromwell was never Oliver Cromwell. He was actually Oliver Williams. But his wife was descended from Thomas Cromwell, who was um, uh, one of uh, Henry VIII's chief advisors. And because she was of higher social status, Oliver Williams, when he married, became Oliver Cromwell. This is a very interesting one, and I still haven't got my head around it, but there was customary coupling with powerful people. So if you had the, the, the opportunity of being visited by the O'Brien, uh, the wife would be offered as entertainment. Now, uh, that's a very, very strange custom, and coupled with that is this one, uh, where, where there was naming of the children on the wife's deathbed, where the wife on her deathbed would call the husband into the room and say, uh, dearest, do you know our eldest? And you'd say, well, of course, sure isn't he my son? Say, ah, well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. <laughs> so there was a very, and Turlock O'Brien apparently was one of these named children. And under Brehan law, uh, there was their concept of infidelity and their concept of illegitimacy totally different to what we have today. Um, because uh, illegitimate children got uh, a lot of rights, in many, many ways the same rights as the natural children. <coughs> so they had uh, rights of possession and rights of land. So it was a very, very different society back in Ireland in those days. And then, of course, there's anglicization of the surname. Uh, that can result in what looks like a surname switch. Uh, the surname Green w could be associated with Hooney and Fahey and even Gleeson. And there's many other causes of, of uh, these surname and DNA switches, not just illegitimacy or adoption. And what are the chances that the surname that you have goes back to, and the DNA that you have, goes back to the person that originated your surname? About 50-50. So all of us have a 50-50 chance that there's been some kind of a switch on our direct mail line going all the way back in time, which is really a very, very high uh, percentage. Um, but as Shakespeare said, a Malloy by any other name would smell as sweet. <laughs> a Malloy is a Malloy is a Malloy. So it doesn't matter where your name originated from, you are a Malloy. It doesn't matter whether you've got uh, DNA that matches one of the groups or you don't, you're still a Malloy. Um, 
And why would there be no match? So that brings us back to why there'd be no match. Um, we need more people to join the project so we can move people out of the ungrouped section into the grouped section. Um, and it brings us back to the actual results themselves. So looking at group, uh, let's look at each group a little bit closer. Where are they from? Where did the name arise? How long have they carried the name? Is there any evidence of a switch in the surname or the DNA? Any evidence of chance matches? And we might be looking at, we might be misled by some of the matches. Uh, where do they sit on the tree of mankind? Who are their nearest uh, genetic neighbors? Does this give us any clues to their origin? And does this fit with the ancient annals? And ultimately, what is the branching structure of each of the groups in the project? So group one. Um, Malloy, 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 Malloy. Um, these are their most distant ancestors. And you can see over here, they're all from Ireland. And this is the results. The mutations in the results, sorry. Thank you. Uh, are marked by these uh, colored squares. So you get pink uh, and, and blue squares, just giving an indication of how close or how far away two people are related. If you look at these last two here, they both have a pink mutation here. They've got a blue mutation here, 11, 11. Another one here, 10, 10. These probably are very closely related to each other, just by looking at that. And if you look at their most distant ancestors, we've got John Malloy and Charles Malloy. This is uh, Virginia or Pennsylvania. So this particular person is from the United States. And this is where the DNA is actually very useful for, for the diaspora Irish, where you know, a lot of people, they em their ancestors emigrated to the United States, and all that they have is that my great-great-grandfather came from Ireland, but have no clue as to what part of Ireland their ancestor came from. But doing the DNA, you can actually tie in to somebody who's a close genetic match who's been living on the land for centuries. And that gives you a starting place to start your own genealogical research, uh, searching for that emigrant ancestor's origins. So where is group one from? Well, Ireland, because we see it up here. Um, how long have they carried the name? Well, from the... Uh, most distant ancestor, 1697, is this particular uh, group, just looking at the genealogies. But if we use that uh, tip tool, looking at the uh, STR markers and calculating what's the most distant ancestor, it brings us back to about 1630, which is not very far. Not very far. So we're looking at that. This, this group have carried the name for about 400 years. Is there any evidence of a surname or a DNA switch? Uh, not that I can see. They're all Malloys. I've looked at their individual results. There's not really any indication there that there could have been a surname or a DNA switch. Um, where do they sit in the, the tree of mankind? One of them has done a SNP testing and is L47. But that's 4,400 years old. So that's really still quite upstream on the tree of mankind. That's going to be somewhere in um, Western Europe. You know, um, that would have arisen somewhere in Western Europe. We need to do more SNP testing. Who are their nearest neighbors? We don't have enough information. Any further clues to their origin? No. What are the next steps? Big Y testing, SNP testing. We need more data. So that's group one, and there's not very much we can say about them at this point in time. Group two, then, um, and this is their DNA signature. You can see these two people here at the bottom, they have no mutations. They're exactly the same, exactly the same. So these two people will, actual, in actual fact, be very closely related to you, to each other potentially. They may know how they're related to each other. They might know, oh yeah, we're second cousins. We both did the test. Or it may be that they both go back to different, most distant known ancestors. And if they just compare their family trees, they could actually find out how they are connected and maybe bring their family tree back an extra generation. Um, one of them has done the big Y test. So where are they from? Ireland. This is where it says up there, Ireland, Ireland, Ireland. How long have they carried the name? The genealogy only goes back to 1859. Two people haven't actually filled in that information. And I would encourage everybody who is doing uh, DNA testing to fill in information about their most distant known ancestor, particularly the birth location. It's very, very important. Uh, any evidence of a surname or DNA switch? No. Uh, where do they sit in the tree of mankind? Somewhere below this particular marker here, L1308, this one here, L1308, it's more than 1,400 years old. 
So you're looking at a common ancestor, well, they've come down to about 600 AD. So we're in the era of the Gaelic clans, but we've only got one person from that group who's done the big Y test. We need two. So ideally, this other member here should do the big Y test, and that would bring us from 1,400 years ago, maybe up to 1,000 years ago, maybe up to 600 years ago. So that's uh, about as much as we can say about that particular group. This is where they are on the Tree of Mankind. This is L1308, and they sit down here. And they are a match to somebody called Mangum. And if you look beside them, they've got Mangum, Robertson, Mangum, Parham, Mangum, Mangum, Mangum. And if we look at the Mangums in Ireland, they were relatively ubiquitous as well. Um, if we look at the surname dictionary, we said that Mangan was a numerous name in Munster, Leinster, Connacht. So again, it was all over the place. doesn't give us huge clues. If we look at it on um, the Forebears uh, website, uh, you can see that it was very much an English name, but also some in Tipperary and Dublin. Um, and if we look at another variant, Mangum, again, it's Lancashire, so it's uh, Eastern England, Western England, rather. And Mangam, Again, some in Tipperary and some in um, uh, the Midlands of, of England. Does that tell us anything? Not hugely. So what we do is we go to the Z253 project, because Z253 is one of the upper branches. And there's a lot of projects that deal just with upper upstream branches. And the Z253 project is one of them. And it collects information on everybody who's tested positive for this particular marker, Z253, which is about 4,000 years old. And if we go to that project, we can maybe harvest other uh, close matches from that project. And we see here there's a Jeremiah Creed, there's a Prendergast, there's a Robertson. We throw up surname distribution maps for Creed. Well, there's some in the South Leitrim area, and we did have some alloys from there. Are they related to each other? Uh, Prendergast, Connacht area, uh, Malo uh, Mayo and Galway, and then a huge bunch of them down here. Doesn't tell us a huge amount. Of course, Prendergast is a Norman name as well. Robertson, again, uh, smattering around the country. So, from the surname distribution maps, we really don't have any uh, finer detail on where this group originated from. No additional clues. And again, this needs additional big Y testing as well. Moving on to group five. This group has had four people tested. And you can see the different names here. Max Farron, Malloy, Purcell, Max Farron, Malloy, Purcell, Macmillan, Malloy. So a very interesting array of uh, surnames. This is their uh, DNA profile and the various uh, mutations that you see. Um, just picking out a few of them. Uh, two people up here have a 29 at this level. Uh, these four people here are 19. Uh, does it mean that they're closely related? You know, some people are more closely related to others. Uh, where are they from? Well, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Scotland. So possibly Scots-Irish. Uh, how long have they carried this particular name? Well, from the genealogies, 1680 is the, um, the furthest back they've managed to go. And if you do a tip score on all of those uh, mutations, it estimates the common ancestor lived around about 12 generations ago, which would be about 1600. Any evidence of a DNA or surname switch? Well, yes. Macmillan, Macsparron, Macsparron, Purcell, Purcell. So this is a mixture of different names. The question is, which came first, the Macsparron chicken or the Malloy egg? And that's really what we're trying to decipher with, with DNA. Um, where do they sit on the tree of mankind? This SNP here, BY21596, four people have done the big Y test, and these four people have all come back positive for that particular DNA marker, that SNP marker. And here it is on the Tree of Mankind. These are the dates for this particular marker. It so arose somewhere before 1200 AD. And of course, 1200 was in, within the time that surnames had been adopted. So now we're actually into the surname era with this particular genetic family. Because they've done that big Y testing. They've come down the tree of mankind, and then we're now coming in to a genealogical time frame. Um, and then the various other branches above that, 600 and 1400 BC. So this is where they all sit. 
Now, can we find an explanation for why we have this mixture of surnames all sitting on this branch of the tree of mankind, which is dated sometime just before 1200 AD? Let's look, uh, and again, you have, it's, this is a crude estimate you have to allow for maybe 300 years on either side. But if we look at some of the surname uh, distribution maps, well, first of all, we go to the haplogroup project. We couldn't find any additional ones there. This is Purcell. This is Macmillan. Um, and what you notice about Macmillan is there's definitely a Scots-Irish suggestion there. If we look at it on a different, uh, on the Forebears website, Purcell, it's a Southern Irish name, but also there is this link here between Lowland Scotland and uh, Northern Ireland. If we look at Macmillan, again, we're seeing a very strong connection between Lowland Scotland and Northern Ireland. And if we look at MacSparren, it's practically only in these two areas. So again, a very strong suggestion looking at the surname distribution maps, that Group 5 is actually Scots-Irish. Now, why Purcell and Macmillan and um, Max Barham all have the same genetic signature? Still not sure. Who came first? Was it Max Barham first and then uh, Malloy? We don't know. And one of the things which I haven't got here, but if you look at Milloy and Meloy, you see the same kind of pattern that the Milloys and the Meloys <coughs> were very, very much a Scotch-Irish name. So I think what probably happened was that some Milloys and Meloys came from Scotland, went to Northern Ireland, emigrated over to America, and in America, Meloy became Malloy. Same with Milloy. Milloy became Malloy. And that's how you got the derivation of that particular name for this particular family. So some very interesting uh, results from that. The next steps, we need more people in this project more SNP testing, more family trees, and we need to find out which came first. And as we get more of this SNP data over here, we should be able to construct a family tree out of DNA data. And it will look something like this. Now, this is what I've done for my Gleason project in North Tip. And you can see that the Gleasons arose around about here, about uh, 1000 AD and I've been able to use DNA <coughs> markers to map out a DNA tree so that people can hang their genealogies like Christmas decorations on a Christmas tree at the end of this DNA tree. So again, it's a very, very nice way of separating out the different branches of your uh, family, of your genetic family. And we'll do this for the Malloys as well as the project uh, gets uh, bigger in size. Now I'm gonna talk about group three, four, and six together because they're all descended from Nile of the Nine hostages. Group three, where are they from? Ireland. Um, how long? 1832, 1900. There's only two people in the tree, and they, ha they are exact matches to each other. Uh, there is evidence of a, a surname switch, because this one is Malloy, and this one is Gamsby. So which came first, the Gamsby chicken or the Malloy egg? It's still that question. Um, uh, there's also evidence of chance matches. At the 37 marker level, this person has only six matches, but if you bring it down to just comparing 25 markers, you'll see that they have over a thousand matches. So this tells me a lot of the matches they're gonna have are chance matches, and you cannot put your trust in some of the matches that they're going to have. And only uh, SNP testing is going to help differentiate the true matches from the false matches. Um, M222, Nine of the Nine Hostages was a 5th century warlord. You've seen this from John. Uh, M222, the SNP marker itself, uh, occurred sometime around about 0 AD. So uh, 0 minus 200. Uh, that's when the, uh, this particular uh, SNP marker came into existence. Uh, Nile was around about 450. His son Fiacha, or Fiacra, as it's sometimes uh, written, is supposed to be a descendant of the Omeloids. So certainly having this DNA marker would be consistent with the idea that the Meloids were descended from Nile of the Nine Hostages. Um, or one of his ancestors, it could have been somebody further up the line, so it could have been somebody like that. Group six, um, we're waiting for the big Y results. Uh, they came in, I will reveal them at the end of the presentation. Uh, but group six consists of three people. You can see they're relatively closely matched. In fact, the, the, the second two are exact matches of each other. 
If you look at the most distant known ancestor, it goes back to the same person, Patrick Aloysius Malloy, born in 1827. So these are two close cousins. They know who their uh, most distant known ancestor is, and they are an exact match to each other. Where are they from? Ireland, possibly Burr, because Patrick Malloy came from Burr. Um, uh, the longest they've been carrying the name, according to the genealogies, is 1815. Um, and uh, the tip uh, prediction is about 1870. There's no evidence of a DNA or surname switch. There is evidence of chance matches. Um, where do they sit on the tree? I'm going to run through this. Uh, below DF105, which is also below M222. I want to get on to the uh, Malloys from Offaly now, and then we're going to finish and have some questions. Um, again, a lot of them have done the big Y test. Here you see a variety of different Malloys. There's also Dempsey and a Callahan here. Um, this is their DNA profile. What hits you about this one is there's a lot more colored squares. There's a lot more mutations. And this suggests that this group is an older group than the other ones. And the reason why there's so more mutations is because they've had longer to develop. So I would say that this goes back a lot further than the other ones. And in fact, when you do the analysis, um, you'll see that the tip score goes back to about 1300. So the common ancestor of all of these Malloys is estimated to be around about 1300. Um, they're from Offaly because three of them, uh, no, four of them actually, have got um, pedigrees that go back to Offaly. They've been here for centuries in this part of the country. Uh, there is evidence of a DNA and a surname switch because we've got a Dempsey up there and a Callahan down there. Um, this gives you an idea of the matches, 1,200 matches. So this is a big problem with this particular group. There's a lot of chance matches. So that means when we look at the nearest neighbors, we're not sure who is the nearest neighbor because all the different surnames could just be chance matches instead. Um, they all fit, uh, they all are below ZS8379, and this is it on the Tree of Mankind. Uh, this is the progression of the Malloys through time, different type of diagram. The Malloys are down here. Uh, we have a timeline starting at 28,000 years ago, Caspian Sea, coming down 6,000, 4,000, 4,000, 2,000, 1,800. And you can see that all of these SNP markers mark a new branch of the tree, a new branch of the tree, a new branch of the tree. Every 100 years, every 1,000 years, a new mutation occurs, and that marks a new branch of descendants. And the Malloys are down here. Group three has only come down as far as M222. So they're stuck up here because they haven't done any further testing downstream. Group six are stuck at this level here, DF105, because they haven't done enough testing further downstream. But Malloy group four, seven people have done the big white test, and they are firmly placed down here. There's one person that stands out, and that is uh, one of the group, uh, one of the members of group four is a chance match. He's actually negative for ZS8379, which is this marker here. So he sits on one of the branches below DF105. There are 14 of them. We don't know which one he sits on. He will need to do the big white test to get himself further downstream. But it's very interesting that even though he's a close match to the other people in group four, it's actually a chance match. And his common ancestor is more likely to be uh, 2,000 years ago, rather than within the last 1,000 years. <coughs> so, and this is what the Malloys look like on the big tree, the, the Offaly Malloys. And we can date these various branches, um, and you can see that this group here arose about 1,000 years ago, and all of these DNA markers below that are specific to the Malloys of Offaly. What you're looking at here are DNA markers that are awfully Malloy specific. These are FIRCAL DNA markers. And you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So there's 10 markers so far that are Malloy specific. One of these ones here, because you can see that all the Malloys sit under this group of four markers. In time, as more people join, this group will be split into different branches. And one of these markers will become the overarching Malloy DNA signature. Um, this is another example that you may have seen from Jeff Malloy, one of our <coughs> admins. But I'm going to go on to the nearest neighbor analysis, uh, looking for new neighbors, 
but I wasn't able to find anything more than Dempsey, Daly, Callahan, and Harrington. Do these give us any further clues to the origin? They're all over the place, so it doesn't isolate us more in the Midlands. Um, so in terms of next steps then, uh, the member's genealogy suggests Fiercal. Nearest neighbour analysis is inconclusive. We need more local Irish participants to bolster these results, and we need more big Y results from the near neighbours. So the last thing I want to show you is coming back to some of the historical texts. Here is the family tree of Nile of the Nine Hostages. Here is uh, Fiacra, his son, who was the alleged ancestor of the Malloys. This is actually um, detailed quite nicely in the uh, pedigree by O'Hart, who talks about uh, Ochi, brother of Tuhal, uh, of the uh, McGeoghan pedigree, was the ancestor of um, Malloy. And we go to the uh, McGeoghan pedigree, we do see it here. Ochi was the ancestor of the Malloy, uh, his brother was Tuhal, his father was Fiach, his father was Nile of the Nine Hostages. And this is very much in keeping with the SNP marker M222, which is associated with Nile of the Nine Hostages. But then if we come down through the pedigree, and this comes up to about the 1600s, we see that the uh, Malloys were genetically related to the McGagans and to the Higgins and to the Donakers, Donaher, and Dooners. And we come further down. Donal O'Malloy was the first to assume this surname. Um, we're also related to the Finnegans. We're also related to the Malloys of Connacht. So the Malloys of Connacht were of the same stock, the same descendant, the same family tree. And also in 1590, Conal O'Malloy surrendered his lands to Queen Elizabeth and got a regrant thereof. The fact that there's a date means that we can date the ancestors of Malloys of Connacht as around about 1300, branching off from the main tree. 1150 for the Finnegans, 1030 for the first assumption of the surname, which is very much in keeping with what we assume. It's about 1,000 years ago. And then further back, the Donohers, 700, the Higgins and the McGagans, 610. So we've got a very nice plan that can then be confirmed or refuted by DNA testing. And that's why it's, it's very, very exciting for the, the, the Offaly Malloys, is that we actually have an ancient genealogy that goes all the way back to Nile of the Nine Hostages, and we can actually test that through DNA to see whether it's true or not. Because a lot of these ancient genealogies would have been propaganda. Um, to what extent this one is propaganda, we don't know. But the DNA is actually telling us, so far, it looks like it's true. So that's a very exciting aspect of it. Um, also, there's Aga Donoher uh, Malloys in Kings County, possibly related to the Fircal Malloys, common ancestor maybe in the 1400s. Uh, we also have the uh, Roscommon Malloys. They are also descended from the Fircal Malloys. <coughs> So if we test a Roscommon Malloy, we should see a genetic match with the uh, group 4 Malloys. Um, and lastly, oh yes, there is a difference of opinion. Some people think the Roscommon Malloys are from a different stock. Some people think it's the same stock. DNA can prove whether that's right or wrong. These people probably have been debating it for decades back in the 1800s. We now have the opportunity to actually um, confirm or deny it. So multiple origins of the Malloy name, everyone has a 50-50 chance of not going all the way back to the originator of their surname. There's at least six distinct groups so far, two in Ireland, one Scots-Irish, three descended from Nile of the Nine Hostages. Um, this is how the groups look currently. Uh, group six, the big Y results came in. Are they or are they not related to group four? A11227. Group six and group four are from the same common ancestor. They will now be amalgamated into one. But if we actually look at the genetic distance for this person who's from group six, his closest match is group six, then a step of three distance from group six, then group four, group four, uh, on group, group four, group four, group four, group four, on group, and group four. So it's um, a, a quite a, a mixture. The other thing to note is that he is a match of seven out of 37, to the person that doesn't have a common ancestor but still sits in group four. So this is again an example of the chance match throwing a spanner in the works. And uh, also there's somebody that he matches that isn't in any of the groups. He's actually in the on-group section. So that really concludes the presentation of where we are so far. We need more people to test. 
we need more people to do the SNP testing. Um, ideally, we need two big Y tests from each group. Uh, more research is needed on the historical text. Somebody needs to go back to Lower Mornan and ALOC and look it up and then try and correlate it with what the DNA is saying. But we have exciting times ahead for the Malloy clan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Morris. Pleasure. Uh, wonderful presentation. It's very enlightening, and, and I'm sure it's generated some questions. You know, I think what we're going to do is just take a couple of questions, sure. and, then, uh, and then we'll break. The bar is going to reopen in about five minutes. So um, take five minutes of questions. Sure. If you have other questions, I'll be around yeah, afterwards. Yeah, so. Morris is going to be here afterwards, so you can connect one on one, and obviously you have email and, and that too. And if you want any DNA kits at all, then come up to me. You don't have to do it tonight. You can actually take it home with you, should you uh, desire. Uh, you don't need to give me any money at all. You can just fill in the form and then um, send it off, and they'll just take it out of your credit card or whatever. So um, any questions in particular? <coughs> Sorry, it's a very erudite presentation, really absolutely wonderful. Now, I tell you, uh, for somebody who has uh, rather limited knowledge of, uh, shall we say, computer skills. It's, I find very different when I get reports of people with differing surnames, mainly saying that they have tested on the, the big Y. And uh, now I just, uh, it's double dutch to me to try and read sure. what the, the printout is. Is there any way that we can get some translation that we can accept? that we can understand exactly what is implied in all the various headings that are there. Because it's, it's, I know it's computer speak, but it's also very, uh, if you like, uh, tied in with the DNA. Sure. It's, it's, it is very difficult to understand the DNA. It takes a, lo uh, a long time for me to get to where I am today with my understanding of it. And it's, uh, uh, but the, this is being recorded. So you will find this available on YouTube, so you can watch it again. I've, I have whizzed through the slides, because there's a lot of them there. But uh, at least this will now be a resource for the project, so that anybody who wants to look at the YouTube video can do it again. If you have specific questions, then of course you can contact myself or John, and we'd be more than happy to uh, answer them. Um, it might be possible at some point in time to do uh, maybe a, an online workshop, and maybe take people through the results. Uh, that might be a possibility as well. So, um, but I think for the, the best that I can say is that for now, just keep an eye on the website, look at the news section and the results section because that's where we will be posting regular updates on what we've found. Um, but I think this is the first time that we've actually had a proper uh, formal presentation on the DNA project. Um, and I think this is probably going to be the first of, of many um, and it's a nice way of kind of setting the scene. Uh, so as time goes on, hopefully you'll get a better understanding of it. By all means, drop me an email if you have any specific questions. Uh, the question, yes, question here. My mother was Malloy, and I thank her for that. But um, what would be the best DNA test for me to take to, to trace it? If, you, if your mother was a Malloy, then you won't have got your Y DNA from your mother. You'll have got your Y DNA from your father, different surname. But does your mother have a brother? No. Okay. Does your mother have a male Malloy relative? No. Okay. None that I know of living. Okay, well then you're in the same situation that I was in with one of my ancestral lines. I was very interested in my Spiran name, but of course he was in the middle of my family tree. So what I had to do was I had to find a Spiran male cousin to do the Y DNA test. I had to go back up to my three times great grandfather and then trace down every single descendant that he ever had until I found a male, 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 and I found somebody and I said, I need to contact this person. And I was, but I don't know him, and how am I going to find him, and all that kind of stuff. And I was talking about this to my best, best friend, who just lives down the road. And he said, oh, sure, I know him. He works in the law library with me. I can introduce you to your cousin. So he introduced me to my cousin, and uh, he was very happy to do the test. And we managed to get the DNA, and his DNA came back, and it helped me jump from 1800 back to the uh, late 1600s in Limerick. And that's, uh, it pointed me in a whole different direction that I would never have gone in, in a million years, without the DNA. 
I went to the University of Limerick Library, uh, opened um, the Earl of Dunraven's uh, box of old records. First one I took out, I thought, smell the old parchment, you know, all that old musty smell. I thought, okay, this has nothing to do with me, but I'm going to read it anyway. My ancestor's signature was at the bottom of the page. So I actually held a document from 1697 with uh, Matthew Spearin's uh, signature at the bottom of the page. He was a witness on the transfer of tithes between one person and another. So you never know what you will find. I would never have found that if it wasn't DNA connecting me with um, a group of people who went back to that point in time. So find a male Malloy relative and get them tested. Okay, thank you, Morris. So Pleasure. That was good. Um, okay. And again, if you have other questions, Morris, I'm around. For a while. But the main event, Johnny Butterfield, I only get to hear Johnny play once every three years. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to tonight. So let's. Uh... I've only one joint. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all join in. I want to ask one question just very briefly. One of the most interesting aspects of Rogan history is where the Malays went to when they were dispossessed of their lands. Right. Does the DNA help us to find out where they went to? Absolutely, because the DNA is going to be able to tie different Malloys into a, a family tree like that one I showed you for the Gleasons. It'll be able to tie uh, people into that big DNA, genetic family tree. You hang your genealogies on that family tree. What's part of your genealogy? The origin and townland origin of your most distant known ancestor. So what we should be able to see is this branch stayed in Ballyboy. This branch went off to um, Westport in Mayo. This branch went off up north and then they sailed over to Canada. This branch went down south, and then they went over to England and ended up over there. So, th but we need more and more people to join the project. So that's the only, that's the only stumbling block at the moment. We need uh, more people to join. And I think that's what happened to my, my ancestors. You know, my, my oldest known ancestor is Richard Malloy, and he was living in Tipperary, Moyglass, you know, before he left in 1848. So, you know, but, but, but my DNA connects me with the awfully Malloys. So, so when did he leave Offaly? He was forced to leave Offaly and he moved down to Tipperary. The DNA suggests. Fascinating questions. Anyway, thanks very much for your attention. Thank you. Go and have a drink. And we're going to introduce you to Johnny. Thank you.